With our special guest tonight, David Sarita. You know, we uh, talked about water last week in the cave, six inches of it. Tonight, we're going to talk about water, the great mystery with David, and also consciousness. Our guest, David Sarita, next on Coast to Coast AM. Nobel Prize winners and more amazing scientists, biologists, and chemists are discovering the incredible properties of water. Water, it appears, has memory and consciousness, and as it turns out, our bodies and entire universe is made mostly of the stuff, H2O. Find out how this new science is helping to explain the consciousness of the universe. We're going to turn now to our friend David Sarita. David's first aspiration in life was to become an astronaut, and after seeing a UFO with a friend, David grew up as a UFO enthusiast. His interest in space, religion, philosophy, astronomy, and science led him on his career in related fields. David has studied world religion, and here he is. Hey, David, how are you? Hey, George, good to hear your voice. What's new with you? Well, enormous things. I mean, in fact, this little element, hydrogen and oxygen, water, has got me more excited in the past year than just about anything. Because there are breakthroughs and new research being done into water that could solve the energy crisis, could reclaim polluted waterways and help heal amazing diseases just by this profound discovery that's being done by and researchers all over the world. I mean, it's really incredible. But also, water may have the ability to communicate virtually over any distance in the universe instantaneously and thereby ultimately giving us the possibility of communicating with other star systems through super sensors that are sensitive to certain vibrations in water. I mean, it's it's really the most incredible miracle, and I've been enlightened in the past uh, couple of years into the subject of water, but also um, where this research is going and, and how it can really solve almost all of our problems. And we look at the world today, and you see it more than I do, because, I mean, what you're doing with your show, you're, you're interviewing the most interesting people, I think, on the planet almost every night. What a fun job I've got. Yeah, yeah I, I, sometimes I wonder, what's it like to be in George Norrie's mind? Because you hear, you know, and you listen to <laughs> the people so intensely every night of the week, except for your, you know, your vacations and your breaks. And I just can't imagine what it's like to be in, inside of your mind. But it's, you know, when you, when you first say water to people, they think, oh, you know, it's just, you know, the stuff I drink every day and I bathe in it. I mean, what could be so special? Exactly. But when you consider that, let's go, let's first start with the Big Bang, you know, the birth of the universe. Over 100 to 1,000 seconds after the Big Bang, hydrogen is born, the H and H2O, two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. And that hydrogen establishes itself virtually everywhere in the universe. It's number one on the periodic table. And as we, as we see the birth of the universe and we see the, the, the beginnings of the spiraling arms of, the, for example, our own Milky Way galaxy, those spiraling gas arms are made of hydrogen. And then you think of smaller spirals start to form and stars are born. Light is born because of hydrogen fusion. Our sun is fusing hydrogen, manufacturing helium, and giving us light. And you think of the hundreds of billions of stars in the Milky Way galaxy all burning with hydrogen. And then you come to the idea that 13 and a half or so billion years later after the Big Bang, organic life, human beings are born, and we're 75 to 90 percent water, depending on how much you know, water you drink. And all living things, even mosquitoes, need water. So you think of, now, what does it mean if scientists can prove that this little, this little element that is virtually existent everywhere in the universe, can communicate with different bodies of distant hydrogen instantaneously, and that it has consciousness, and that the consciousness of water is kind of like um, um, Professor Rustam Roy at Penn State calls an alphabet. You can give it new words and new sentences, and therefore it structures itself differently according to the information you give it. Does it reason, David? Say that again? Does it reason? Does it have that ability? Well, that's further to be known. But now that we followed that model, let's look at consciousness. We look at even actually the second verse in the book of Genesis in the Bible. We see God moves God's 
spirit over the face of the waters, and then there's light. So we look at this model, and actually, before I go further, there's an amazing photo on your website. You know the one of the, the woman's glasses, and you see the teardrop, and you see the shape of what mm-hmm. looks like you know, the Virgin Mary or a holy figure? It's in the photo section on your website. Right. So we see that, you know, an, this example that Masaru Emoto really started, the idea of cryogenically flash-freezing water after it's been exposed to emotion, music, thoughts, and different intentions. And we see, for all the people who, who know Masaru Emoto, he's, he's pretty much a legend now, you see that this, this idea that cryogenically, instantaneously freezing water, we're freezing the structure of the information inside of water, and it gives us different architectures. And when we look at those architectures, in a way, they're kind of like a language. When you see flash frozen water crystals exposed to Beethoven, you see this beautiful symmetry. If you say the words, I hate you to the water, you see this chaos. If you say Hitler, you see this crazy mess. If you say thank you, you see, again, these amazing architectures. So the idea that what Masaru Emoto has started, and I just had the opportunity to have um, lunch with him last week. And, He's a great guy. We had him on the show a couple of years ago, David. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that. And, and now it's like the research is exploding. I mean, people like Kurt Worthlich, who won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, Martin Chaplin, He's a professor at London South Bank University. Martin Chaplin is one of the pivotal um, scientists and professors at a major university who's in the middle of this argument over whether water has memory and consciousness or not. And when you read his paper, which I you know, had the pleasure to read, you see that the evidence in support of water having memory and consciousness is so overwhelming and, and the arguments against it are because we don't know why and how it has memory and consciousness. And because we can't explain how it works, he says we can't even explain how gravity and why gravity works, yet we know gravity exists. The observations are consistent across the board over hundreds of researchers into this phenomenon. And what we're seeing is that you can put a new language of consciousness on water to do a myriad of different miraculous um, problem-solving uh, technologies. For example, we can restructure water to actually help heal the human body. We'll get into this later. You can restructure water to reclaim polluted waterways. Whole lakes uh, utterly devastated by environmental pollution have been reclaimed in three years by introducing restructured water, giving the water new information. And now we see the idea that the, the structure of hydrogen may be the missing link to nuclear fusion, the, David, the holy grail of, of infinite energy. Some time ago we had a guest on as well as Dan was uh, Raymond Grace, mm-hmm. and he, through uh, his abilities and everybody else's, concentrated on water and then took little pieces of the water and used it and put it into you know larger bodies of water, and it did much the same thing as Dr. Emoto has been working on. Right. That shows also the power of a very focused positive intention can actually transform a whole body of darkness or polluted water, which is something you know um, um, that has been done with with holy water. There's been many tests with uh, testing religious or spiritually blessed water from multiple religions, and when you put that holy, you know, blessed water in a vial of ordinary tap water, it renders all of the tap water holy. So it shows that the overwhelming darkness doesn't envelop the the positively restructured water, rather vice versa. It shows how powerful that is. So because I spent, you know, most of, uh, uh, the better part of 10 years of my life working on nuclear fusion and supporting the works of Dr. Bogdan Maglic and all of his um, co-supporters in Helium-3 Fusion, and th- the goal to attain this environmentally benign form of energy has really, to me, it's kind of like it's disappeared. It, it has fallen off the face of the map. It, it's something that people don't even talk about anymore because because they couldn't attain fusion. If we did, we wouldn't be in this mess that we would have electric cars that do five and 700 horsepower, and, you know, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't be fighting in and, and struggling over the last remains of energy resources, fuels. But before we go to nuclear fusion, I mean, you really see 
the miracle here is that let's let's take for example an experiment that was done and this is where I get really excited because it also relates to the search for communication with other star systems. Okay. You see in this experiment done, and this is, this is in Water, the Great Mystery, um, where they take two, a pitcher of water, and they separate the pitcher of water into two pitchers of water, and they separate both pitchers at a great distance. And when you expose information to one pitcher of water, the other at a distance restructures itself according to that information instantly using atomic clocks. That's incredible. Instantly. And what amazes me about that is over and over and over again, no matter how far you go back, and going back, actually, there's a, a Russian scientist named Alexander Jajewski, whom in the 1930s noticed that bacteria in water would constantly become agitated during the exact moment of solar flares. And he noticed this over and over and over again. Whenever there was a solar flare, the activation of the bacteria going crazy happened before the solar radiation hit the Earth. In fact, it takes 8.3 minutes for sun solar radiation to travel from the sun's 93 million miles mm -hmm. from Earth to get here. Right. So the bacteria knew it instantly. Why? Why did the bacteria in the water know? Well, the interesting thing is our sun is 93% hydrogen, and there's oxygen in the sun. And that means that these two bodies of water at a distance are actually talking to each other instantaneously. And the bacteria in the water gets activated because the water is receiving this information. Now, when we consider the vast distances, for example, the distance between the, our Milky Way galaxy and the Andromeda galaxy, which is 2.2 million light years away, if you were communicating using radio waves with Andromeda, if we could, it would take two, over 2.2 million years to get there. But yet, the hydrogen in the stars in the, in the Andromeda galaxy and the hydrogen in our stars and the spiraling arms of the Milky Way galaxy and the water in our own bodies can communicate instantaneously over the... See, you're, you're on to something, David. You see, there's something going on here. There's something so deep going on here that it, it, it's literally starting to explode because the numbers of researchers who are, who are exploring water, in fact, I got myself right in the middle of, of one of the greatest you know, recent discoveries in water, which we'll get into in a bit here, but you see that it's, it's an argument. I mean, it's not like... You know, it's, it's, it's actually announced in all the peer-reviewed press and, you know, Scientific American, you know, water has consciousness, it's unanimous. One of the things you find in the physics community is whenever something is new, even when, in fact, this is a great example, in as early as 1927, people, at the fifth Solvay Conference on Physics at Brussels, Belgium, where Einstein, Heisenberg, Niels Bohr, Max Planck, uh, Paul well, Dirac. All the heavy hitters were there, David. All the heavy hitters were there. And one of the major subjects at that particular conference was mind over matter. Heisenberg and Niels Bohr came to Einstein and said, it looks like um, the results of the experiments are being affected by the minds of the researchers. And Einstein flips out. <laughs> this is 1927. This isn't, you know, the ideas that were introduced in films like What the Bleep Do We Know and What's Happening with Water, is, this isn't new. They've known this since 1927. And Einstein wanted this mathematical universe where you could predict, the, for example, the position of the sun and where the earth will be tomorrow. And, and these things are easy. You know, it looked like using light to measure events in the universe was so reliable that what scientists thought would happen is when they went into the micro-universe, quantum physics into the atom and smaller, finding the position of where the electron would be at any given time and its angular spin was unpredictable. They couldn't predict anything. And this is where they started to go crazy. They started to realize that it appeared consciousness was inexorably linked to matter at the quantum level. And because consciousness is unpredictable and random, just like the way we think every day, should I do this or should I do that? And a person decides, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put all my money in this stock, in the stock market, and it goes down that day, you know, or it goes up. I mean, this is how the mind works. The, the subatomic particles were behaving like the way people think. 
And you couldn't put, Einstein couldn't put a mathematical formula on it. So he went crazy. But over 10 years later, he's the one who said that anyone who becomes seriously involved in the pursuit of science becomes convinced that a spirit, not a force, a spirit was manifest in the laws of the universe. A spirit vastly superior to that of man. And that is where this is all going. That if we go, George, I believe if we go deep enough into what's happening with water, and we'll demonstrate this tonight uh, uh, very faithfully, I believe, that the answer to all of our problems can be found in this holy grail, in, in, in a cup of water. There is so much energy in a, in a glass of water, we could, we could power, you know, factories, cars, everything with this. And I'm not just talking about hydrogen. I'm talking about fusion. And David, is it the water or is it just the hydrogen part? It's, it's all of it. It's, it's you know, thing. hydrogen, remember, the, the experiment that was, that was discovered by Alexander Jevsky, which is in, in the 1930s, which is only years and moments after the Solvay Conference in 1927. That's when he notices that the bacteria in the, in the water are becoming agitated instantly upon the activation of, say, an X-class solar flare. Not eight minutes later. They have pre-knowledge or pre-cognition. See, water, in fact, it's already being used in Russia as a sensor to, as a pre, pre, uh, what you call pre-cognition to earthquakes. They're already using it in, in super sensors now. But now we know because water can communicate over any distance in the universe through what's called Einstein's spooky action at a distance which is the only thing Einstein discovered that was faster than light. We're now finding that not only is water possibly, it's conscious, but the question of whether it has intelligence is, it is a much deeper question. But now we see that this, this idea of this superstructure that is happening in the sun may be the secret to nuclear fusion. And, and that is, is getting... Is, a very, very exciting breakthrough, very exciting breakthrough. So. And I also think that the possibility of health issues is dramatic. Well, the possibility, it's already being demonstrated. And the, just in Japan alone, and a lot of this is thanks to Masaru Emoto's work, restructured water in the health industry is a $1 billion a year business. Putting, when we look at, for example, Masaru Emoto showed us, and, and there are also many um, labs in, in Russia, people like Leonoid, Izvakov is also doing this. In fact, he's the one who took my photo, which is up on your website, of the sound of the sun, which we'll get right. into. Nice job, by the way. And what, what we find is that when we look at ordinary tap water, which most of us are drinking in our cities, it just has horrible structure, horrible architecture, and it basically is robbing us of, of energetics. In fact, even Andy Rooney said on 60 Minutes when they tested all these bottled waters that they were energetically dead. I mean, I was really amazed to see but that. You can, but you can change that, can't you? But you can change that by putting intention, it seems. You can change that by putting music, when we see what happens when we put Beethoven and well, Bach. Let's, and, talk, let's talk about all that, David, when yeah. we come right back on Coast to Coast AM. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. I'm George Norrie, David Sarita with us. David's work, the latest, we're talking about Water, the Great Mystery DVD report. David, let's get back into the science of this, first of all, because I find it fascinating. It's almost as if, is it accurate to say that water, and we're going to talk about what it allows us to do. We're not just talking about water, folks, but it has an incredible ability. Do you believe it's alive? I believe it is alive. I believe ultimately that everything is alive, but I think water being the, you know, made of hydrogen and oxygen, you know, number one and on the periodic table of elements, it, it was the universe's way at the beginning of creation to establish kind of the universal hard drive or what, what, what um, metaphysicists call the Akashic records. Because water has memory and it establishes itself um, within 100 to 1,000 seconds after the Big Bang, both hard, you know, heavy water, deuterium, is I think about 100 years after the Big Bang. It actually allows the universe to, to, because you think about, we didn't come into the scene of the creation of the universe, at least on this planet, until, you know, over 13.5 billion years later. 
And if you think, this is like the ultimate Zen question. If there's the saying, if a tree falls in the forest and nobody's seeing it fall, is it falling? And it's the, the same question to a quantum physicist is if nobody is observing the, the quantum universe, is it even happening? And then you think of the creation of the universe, which lasted over 13 and a half billion years before organic life was formed. If nobody was watching it, and scientists are recording the first, you know, hundred millionth of a second. All the, I mean, they're measuring down into femtoseconds, nanoseconds to the first second right. after the Big Bang. Then they get to, you know, the cosmic microwave background radiation, the formations of the spiral galaxies and the stars, and then the stars are producing fusion and they're giving birth to all the periodic table of elements, and then eventually planets. If nobody's watching all that, then it's not happening. And so to answer your question, does water, is it alive? I actually believe I've seen enough evidence in both the spiritual, in describing, for example, the nine levels of superconsciousness that get into these larger and larger cosmic spheres or rings of consciousness, that this consciousness actually exists somewhere, that everything that is going on in the Milky Way galaxy is being stored in the memory of the hydrogen atoms in the in the spiraling um, gas fields where micro spirals are formed where, and, and where stars are born. Now, this is really a simple story. I'll tell you to kind of equate to that. I was at my DVD manufacturer, Duplium, in Texas, and he's showing me how movies, whole movies, are pressed into what we, what we know are CDs or DVDs. Mm -hmm. And he says, he shows me the machine actually making them. It's just a droplet of plastic spins on this disc. And he says, your entire movie is in that plastic. And then a thin mirror coating <laughs> goes on the bottom. The laser scans through and bounces off the mirror on the bottom through the plastic and reads it. And then on your TV screen, you're seeing this whole movie. Well, it, is a, it is amazing, isn't plastic it? Plastic has memory. <laughs> this whole movie, you're watching the sound, the pictures, and the absolute pristineness on your big plasma. That's in a sheet of plastic. So... For scientists who don't believe water has memory, just look at ordinary plastic. It has yeah. memory. So I look at the spiraling arms on the Milky Way galaxy as kind of like the grooves on a phonographic record. This is the universal hard drive. And when you see that hydrogen, I mean, our bodies are made mostly of water. Kurt Wuthrich, who won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2002, he shared the prize, He's one of the strong proponents for the, the realization that water has memory. I mean, this is a Nobel Prize winner. And he's one of the things he says, and I think it's kind of funny in Water the Great Mystery, is your head is full of water. And this water communicates telepathically, huh. instantaneously. So they do this experiment um, done, conducted by, by Leonid Izvakov in Russia. And they take, this is an actual experiment in telepathy. They take two human beings at great distances, over 3,000 miles apart, and they're hooking their brains up to EEGs and, and you know, electrocardiograms right. and measuring all their vital signs. And these two people are going to attempt to make contact through telepathy. And even though you can't read, you know, what is the thought the person is sending, they can analyze the, the exact precision of the waveforms in the data and the brain waves. And as soon as the experiment begins, instantaneously over thousands of miles this other person is measuring the exact same wave um, brain wave patterns as the sender the receiver so this action at a distance thing has been tested with humans it's been tested with bodies of water we see an experiment <clears throat> done in the 1930s that demonstrates action at a distance which is instantaneous communication between the sun and the earth the little microbes in the water that was Alexander Jajewski. And we see that, for example, this is even done in radionics healing, where we take a sample of a person's blood, and a radionics healer is at a, sometimes a great distance away from their client, and they use tuning forks, and they send vibrational frequencies into the person's blood. This was discovered by Ruth uh, Drown. At a distance, that person would receive that frequency, and it would heal them. Healing at a distance. But what's amazing about all the experiments with living systems and non-living systems, if we consider, if, for those who don't believe water is alive, 
even experiments all using atomic clocks, for example, there was an experiment done where they took some, a blood sample from a man and they separated his blood at a distance. They hooked his blood up to all these super sensors and then they hit the guy in the shin. You know, somebody, you know, banged him in the shin with a little, you know, two by four. And <laughs> ouch. Was hurt. he goes, ouch, and his blood responds instantly, instantly at a distance. So what this is starting, you know, what I'm starting to get excited about all this, and, and I mentioned this uh, briefly, is that, oh, my God, th- there's something else besides light. There's something that is it's not just accidental. It, it's every single time we see these experiments, whether they're on astrophysical great distances or small distances between living things, there is something communicating instantaneously, and that means – this, this thing that's communicating instantaneously is the water in our bodies, the water in our earth, the, the, the hydrogen in our sun, the, the possibility that the reason the sun is heating up right now and contributing to global warming because it senses in the communication with the earth's oceans that they're in danger. So what happens in your own body when you have a virus? You get a fever, you get hotter to burn off the virus. So... I think it's all connected in this. If we could tune into how water, hydrogen, is sensing this intelligent information instantaneously, we may get a new picture of our universe. That's where now, this is going. David, what made the scientists, someone like Dr. Emoto, even think about this? Well, see, to even think about it, I think it, it really does go all the way back to the 1927 Solvay Conference in in physics. And that is when that question was taken on. And the answers were not satisfactory. The thing that frustrated physicists was that you couldn't put, you couldn't quantify consciousness in a mathematical formula because consciousness is so random and so unpredictable that it really, I mean, Einstein even admitted his own theory of relativity falls apart at the quantum level. You cannot predict anything. Quantum physicists get excited when they're even close to 1% predictability. And, and it's kind of, it's really amazing. It's kind of the same way in the world of psychic predictions. I mean, sometimes you're accurate and sometimes everything changes because somebody changes their mind. I mean, I even believe if if there was an intention right now to, say, start a war, you know, with, with, uh, with Russia, let's just say that was an intention. If that intention went out, people might start having dreams and visions of nuclear bombs, which I actually know people are, who are having these kind of dreams right now. And then all of a sudden we realize, oh, my God, that's the craziest thing in the world we could possibly do is go into a war with Russia. In fact, we built a space station together. We built the Tokamak fusion reactors together. We've done some of the greatest things together. It would be crazy to go to war with them. Plus, they have the biggest nuclear weapons ever ever built. So we decide let's, we're not going to do it. So all the people who have the visions, because the visions go into consciousness, and, and that consciousness transmits itself, they make a prediction, and it doesn't happen because somebody changes their mind. It's, it's kind of similar to that in the quantum universe. And I really believe that Einstein, in his famous statement that I quoted earlier, is admitting it. He's admitting that there is a consciousness in the universe. But I don't think Einstein lived long enough to know that it was happening with water. Now, when you get into the idea of how do you restructure water and how is water given its informational language and what can we do by encoding water and hydrogen with different languages. Now that's where it starts to get much, much more exciting. And and you were also saying right before the break that intentions, that music uh, has the ability to change water. Let's talk a little bit about Emoto's experiments. First of all, isn't music subjective? I mean, what you might think is good music, I might not, and vice versa. But what makes the water determine what is good, what is bad. Because I've seen Emoto's pictures Mm -hmm. of the water crystals taken when he plays Mozart or Beethoven, and it's glorious, right? It's just, it's pretty. It looks like one of those little prisms we used to look into when we were kids. Kaleidoscope, yeah. Yeah, kaleidoscope. But I've also seen it then when they played harsher music, they look jumbled up and, you know, disoriented and stuff. But my point is, 
there are a lot of people out there that like that kind of music, David. So why does water have the ability to distinguish from that? Well, that's a, that's a fantastic question, actually, because I've asked the same question myself. I was... I would like to see, I have two answers for that. One, I would love to see if somebody just loved, um, you know, um, heavy metal music and Def Leppard and they loved, uh, you know, they really liked it and they hated classical. I would like to see the results, you know. I, um, I would like to see the results of somebody who is impartial to the music. But one thing is, is certain is that there are certain um, harmonics, actual harmonies, and you need to go all the way back to Pythagoras and the music of the spheres, his experience of hearing um, the sound of the sun, which, was, which is where we're headed here soon, and actually the sounds of all the planets are producing a kind of harmonic music. Any music teacher can tell you that there are harmonies and there are disharmonies, and sometimes disharmonies, can be pleasurable. Like if I, I mean, I'm personally, I've listened to a lot of, you know, really radical music sometimes, and I love it. I'm in this crazy mood, and I don't want, you know, structure. I want everything to be, you know, really chaotic. And you really kind of enjoy it. It's kind of fun to go into those spaces in music. But then other times, I just love listening to Beethoven or, or Bach or, or, um, or Glier. Um, my favorite Russian composer is Glier. And I go, but I, I have to admit to myself, honestly, I've never been as high on, on music as I've been on Beethoven's Ninth Symphony or Glier's <laughs> Red Poppy. I mean, no matter how much I listen to you know, the, the heavier music, it can't take me there. So the question is, what is the architecture and the waveform of heavy metal versus a greater harmony, and what does it look like? Now, we're not judging it because there are people who love that music, but then you look at you know, the what is the water responding to a combination of intention and the music, or is it responding to just the music? And when you come to the discovery of the music of the spheres and what I was led to contribute to this movement, which is testing the sound, actual sound of the sun on water, you see something really miraculous. And based on my research into Pythagoras' music of the spheres, he actually experienced in the in the 6th century B.C. going into a higher state of consciousness, he actually heard the sound of the sun. And I, have, I had actually had the same experience myself in, in the 1980s when I did my first Buddhist intensive. And we've, we've played a clip some time ago of, of yeah, Masa's recording actually, of the sun. Of Remember? the actual yeah. sound. Yeah. Now, the Hindu Vedas say that the true sound of Om the mantra Om is the sound of the sun. And what's amazing when, when you play that sound, it is the deepest resonant hum. And myriads of frequencies are blended into that hum, into literally a symphony of Om. And actually at the very height of it, there's a very high frequency sound blended into it. Well, that's exactly as Pythagoras described it, and that's as I experienced it. Human beings hear between 20 and 20,000 hertz, so we don't actually hear the sound of the sun. The sun does make a sound as it moves through the fabric of space, but it's so quiet that when NASA recorded it in deep space, they compressed or concentrated the waves into the audible spectrum. So I actually was searching this for years because I had this experience of hearing the sound of the sun. I knew what it sounded like in this altered state of consciousness, and so did Pythagoras. And it turns out it's exactly as Pythagoras had described it. Well, it turns out that NASA at the University of Iowa has been recording. This is actually really exciting, George, because I don't think I've told you this. But NASA has been recording the sounds of the other planets. Oh, well. Really? And it's really amazing when you what, get... What do they sound like? Well, this is really amazing. His name is Donald A. Gurnett. He's a, a James A. Van Allen, a Roy Carver professor of physics at the University of Iowa. And he and his staff, I mean, it's amazing how NASA does this stuff, and it doesn't make you know, major news. And thanks to your show, I can share this with people. But when they, when they actually recorded, you know, firstly, the sound of the sun... And we're going to go much, much further into that because I believe that's the missing link to nuclear fusion. But when they record the sound of the Earth, the Earth has different dimensions of waves. All the physicists are going, oh, my God, we know 
there's this video on his website. They're all laughing and saying, oh, my God, we know the secret to the universe. It sounds like tropical birds singing. Exactly. Wow, that is and they're all laughing, saying the birds are tuning into the frequencies of the earth, and they're just singing it. It sounds exactly like birds singing. The sound of Saturn's rings is one of the most terrifying things I've ever heard. If you play it late at night, you, you might go running out of the house. I mean, it, it <laughs> Really? It's scary. like a horror movie? Like a, like, like a what? Like, it's like a horror movie? It's, like, it's, it's even more eerie than that. I mean, it's... It does. It just. It's just so vast. It sounds like these giant wheels just cranking and spinning and 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 the vibrations. I mean, again, you can think of the of the rings of Saturn as phonographic records that are recording everything that's going on in the solar system. And Vincent Vincent Price would have been proud of that sound, probably. Mm -hmm. huh? Well, what's amazing is they've recorded many of the planets, not all of them, and so you see the kind of the kind of uh, philosophy that Pythagoras, you know, gave birth to being verified, you know, you know, you know literally thousands of years later. So now when we think about all this sound stuff, and you come to the sound of the sun and you think, okay, this, the core of the sun is about 27 million degrees Fahrenheit. And fusion is taking place between the hydrogen atoms in the sun at this temperature. I just want to give you people a comparative because our attempts at fusion of of deuterium at in, in Tokamak at Princeton, you know, billions and billions of dollars have been spent between this Russian American joint effort to try to fuse deuterium and tritium, which are two David, uh, we're gonna take this break. We're gonna okay. come back, we'll talk more about this. I also want to talk about water's healing principles and uh, and ask you about baptism, because isn't that what we're talking about here, the ability to, you know, use consciousness in water, and then you put somebody in it, we'll be back. With our special guest tonight, David Sarita, we'll be back with David as we talk about water, the great mystery on Coast to Coast AM. David, many things to talk with you about this before we go to calls next hour. Uh, the healing principles of water extremely important. And when you think back at baptism, where they either put water over the forehead of someone or, you know, dump them in water, but it's around prayer, it's around consciousness. Does that have anything to do with this? It, all the experiments um, that we see in Water of the Great Mystery around religion, and, and there's a lot of focus on the baptism and holy water, in fact, the structure, when we see the frozen water crystals of this holy water in a Christian church, that when they flash freeze it in a cryogenic chamber, it is some of the most beautiful symmetry and architecture in any water structure I've ever seen next to the sound of the sun. And we see that also when they put just a, an ordinary tablespoon of this holy water in a huge vat of ordinary tap water and they test it, the ordinary tap water all has the property of holy water. So we see this, and we see, again, going, you know, to answer your question, all the way back to the book of Genesis, where we see, you know, Scripture consistent with science that God moves God's Spirit over the face of the waters, and then there's light. So we see this missing element that consciousness, you know, it... it when it when it places its presence on this water, I really believe there is a divine purpose for the baptism. It, it really, there really is spirit in the water. There really is information, and it, 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 it makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? It, it really does. And you know, when Emoto does the the, you know, the water after Buddhist prayers and Jewish prayers and Christian prayers and Islamic prayers, you really see this incredible beauty, and they're all different. Because the languages are different. But if which, you, I'm sorry, go no, ahead. No, 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 go ahead. If you drink water that, you know, has had good intention, good music played at it, or whatever, and again, under Emoto's experiments, let's assume that that water, the crystals look gorgeous. Mm -hmm. If you drink that water, as opposed to, let's, let's, and let's, you know, put two camps up. The, the, the one group that drinks bad water, uh, in terms of, you know, 
harsh music, uh, you know, you scream at it, you're, you know, evil, and then the group that drinks the good water. What happens, do you think, between the two individuals? Well, I think the person who drinks the the blessed water will be more, will experience more harmony in their body, in their physiology, because the way, for example, our heart is a, an electromagnetic instrument, and our brain, you know, we produce actually magnetic waves. So we think of when you put a harmony in your system, everything else is going to follow. Everything else, the, if the wa- water in your body, which let's say it's ordinary tap water, and you put restructured water into your system, hopefully it's going to do the same thing that the teaspoon did the, of holy water to the ordinary tap water. It's going to transform darkness into light. But see, now you look at the, there's actually an obsession in, in even American you know, culture in, in homeopathic and naturopathic healing as to what is the best way to restructure water. And, and some people are capitalizing and charging enormous amounts of money for water restructuring. And when I went to the sound of the sun, and I realized that in the Hindu Vedas, they say the sound of the sun, no, sorry, the sound of Om, whoever discovers it, accomplishes everything and anything. And the sound of the sun is the true sound of Om. So now I have this sound in my possession from NASA's files, and I, I transfer it into, into my you know, recording programs. And I look, you look at Dante Alighieri, this is another amazing case, where Dante is traveling out of body in the Paradiso, and he, he visits the sun, and he sees that the sun is writing the will of heaven, paradise, on the earth. So that means there must be information in the sun that is truly the master of the solar system and the master restructure. And, one, and early experimenters have also discovered that whenever you find water that's in the presence of sunlight bouncing off of stones and spinning down streams, when you examine this water under the microscope, it has not only incredible symmetry and structure, but its energetics when tested by Konstantin Korotkov on his new you know, Super Aura camera. The energetics of the water is, is so much higher than ordinary tap water in America and even bottled water that it renders it pretty much useless. But now I sent the sun, the sound of the sun, to the producer of Water the Great Mystery, Saida Medvedeva, and last, um, it was Valentine's Day, February 14th, I get this call. The researchers are astounded, David, they are telling me. They've never seen anything. They've never seen water restructured to this level of absolute perfection. And if you go on you know, your website at Coast to Coast AM, you'll actually see the photograph that Leonid Ezvakov and his partner photographed after exposing water to the sacred sound of the sun. And it is so incredible. When I got the photograph, and they just gave it to me recently, and the energetics data, which apparently was off the chart, there was, no, there was no technology, there was no system known to, to humanity that could restructure water to the level that this sound could do. And when you look at it, the architectures of the crystalline structures are so perfect. And so there's 12 spokes coming out of the middle of the architecture, which corresponds to the 12 hours of day and 12 hours of night. There's, there's actually a 24 numerical value in the crystalline structure, and there's a six-pointed star. So you see the sun is reflecting mathematics in all of the geometries of how we understand time. There's two sets of 12, 24 hours in a day. So you'll see six, 12, and 24, um, and I actually wrote a paper about this. And you look at, there's, you look at what that means. What do those three numbers mean? Well, we, we have 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in an hour. We have 12 hours in a day, and then we have 12 hours at night. And you're seeing that in the architecture and of, of the water that has been exposed to the sound of the sun. And what's amazing is the sun is hydrogen and oxygen and helium, and it's sending its message to a droplet of water, which is made of the same, basically the same substance. And it's reflecting in it a structure that tells me something. You know, this is, this is after years and years of watching the frustration of physicists who are conducting Experiments in nuclear fission, for example, at Princeton University, the tokamak fusion reactor is able to produce temperatures 500 million degrees Fahrenheit. Wow. The sun fuses hydrogen at 27 million degrees Fahrenheit. 
and the temperature on the surface of the sun is only 6,000 degrees Celsius, 11,000 Fahrenheit. So how is this sun fusing hydrogen at such a low temperature when actually <clears throat> the, the type of fusion that I was an associate of, which was helium-3 fusion, headed by Bogdan Maglitz, and we had signatures from people, and Nobel Prize winners like Murray Gelman and Norman Rostocker and, and Gwen Seaborg, who chaired the Atomic Energy Commission. I was around all these people. We were working on this, you know, trying to get funding, further funding for fusion. And we were producing temperatures in, in Maglitz's, Bogdan Maglitz's reactor. He's an MIT, you know, Ph.D. from mm -hmm. Yugoslavia of 10 billion degrees. And while the temperatures were so ultra-hot, we, it seemed like we were making progress, but nobody had gone beyond break-even. So the question was, why was the sun able to do it with such a small temperature of only 27 million degrees? I mean, we're way past that at Princeton. And the answer appears to be in the structuring of how the sound waves in the sun, which are being studied at NASA right now, are structuring hydrogen in these groups in different frequencies. And because they're in different frequencies, I believe, and the sun has myriads of frequencies, they're able to blend together because higher frequencies can enter low frequency waveforms or pass right through them. So the idea of nuclear fusion is to overcome the repulsive magnetic force of atoms, just like two ends of a magnet. When you push two positives together, they push away. And heat breaks down magnetic fields, but heat alone is not it. It's not enough. There's something else missing. And so when I wrote this paper that maybe it's the sound of the sun that is, that is the secret. Now, you look at right. this right. is really exciting because you look at our planet Jupiter. Jupiter is made of the same stuff. It's 90% hydrogen, 10% helium. The sun is, it's, uh, I just have it here in front of me, it's pretty much the same. I mean, the numbers are just slightly different. Numbers are different, but it's a same. 92% hydrogen and 7.8% helium. So why is the sun producing light and fusion and, and, and Jupiter isn't? And I think the answer is not in, is the temperature correct? Is the, is, are the elements correct? It has to do with the waveforms, the structure. And if we study this enough, if enough... And, and I actually passed this idea, and I wrote a little paper on it. And in fact, NASA has a, has a whole new discovery in studying the sound waves of the sun. I sent this paper to you know, my friend Boyd Bushman at Lockheed Martin. And I, in fact, Lockheed is actually one of the, the, has one of the solar labs that's researching this in the sound of the sun. And I sent this paper everywhere because I really believe that, and I did get a positive response. I got a response that said, we need to pursue this. This sounds very interesting. And here's the problem. Here we are. We're at, we're at an age where oil prices are, are astronomically high. Oil is definitely polluting our environment. Whether you believe it's contributing to global warming or not, that's that's a debate for some people. It's not for me. But still, it's you know we have oil spills. It's polluting our, our air. It's polluting our our waters with oil spills. Well, and it's polluting our politics. Too. And it's polluting our politics. So if if we have if we if we reorient ourselves. And we look at, you know, what, what is the real problem here in fusion? We, we failed. We, we tried this. We, we came close with cold fusion. We came close with Tokamak. And our helium-3 reactor came amazingly close with $27 million of funding. If we see what, uh, what the, the legacy that Masaru Emoto has given birth to and all the great scientists that are, that are working towards this, could it be that the missing link to fusion is structure, is consciousness, is waveform? And I believe it is, and I believe it needs to be researched. Now, when you apply the same, when you apply the same frequency of the sound of the sun on water for healing the body, because now mm -hmm. we're coming all the way back to another water. Because here we are. We're how, what's the human body? Is eighty percent water? Yeah, 75%? it's almost the same. Like funny because the sun is uh, you know ninety two percent hydrogen. And they say the body, depending on the person, is seventy five to ninety percent water. So we're kind of the same thing. And yet you think, you know, how much dis-ease disease is actually caused by disharmonics in this our this is This is truly remarkable because remarkable. I see where you're headed with this, David, and what a, what a great way to help cure some of our ills. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, by the end of tonight, you're going to have to tell us some of the things we can do to do this, to change the physical structure 
uh, if you can. And also, well, actually, give, me, give me a moment. Uh, tell me about the DVD, Water the Great Mystery. We well, haven't talked about that. Yeah, Water the Great Mystery. I mean, I was filming my film, The Voice, and, you know, we were interviewing a man named Krishna Madapa in Taos, New Mexico, who's working with this new camera that can see the whole aura in three dimensions. And this camera was invented by a Russian um, professor of physics, Konstantin Korotkov, at St. Petersburg Tech University. Mm -hmm. And he's got this movie called Water in his computer, and I'm, I'm watching it. He's showing me little clips of it, and I'm saying, oh, my God, this is the most incredible film I've ever seen. And he said, oh, Americans wouldn't be interested in it. And uh, I said, are you kidding? <laughs> he said, maybe at the university level, and apparently the film had played at the United Nations. Um, and, you know, very, very top researchers are interested in this. But it's so well produced. It was produced for a million and a half dollars by Saida Medvedeva. And I said, I want to see this whole film. It took me three months to get it. When I got it, at the assistance of Konstantin Korotkov and Krishna Madapa, I was so, so astounded and aghast. I was just, oh, my God, I want to watch it over. I've actually seen it almost as many times as, as I've seen Close Encounters of the Third Kind. So that's, that's how good the movie <laughs> is to me, which is getting into the 20s of, of times. And now that people are seeing it in America, it's actually sold over three and a half million copies in, in greater Europe and Russia. So it's really sweeping Europe, and it's won all these awards. And I'm co-distributing the film Voice Entertainment, myself and my partner Jim Law with Betsy Chase, who's one of the producers of What the Bleep Do We Know? We're partners right. in right. the release Thank of you. this film. And it's now coming to America, and we just released it on DVD. And... People are seeing it, and I'm, we're getting emails in that this is the best movie of the year. I mean, that they're, they think it's the most Good enlightening and spectacular film, and it, it's just so beautiful. So that is, when I saw the film, and I'd already, like you, known about Masaru Emoto's work, and he's in the film, and so are all these great scientists that I'm talking about tonight. I realized that, you know, it, it just, I just had one epiphany going off in my mind after the other, and then I started contributing to the research the sound of the sun. So that's where all this is going. In fact, it, there's actually a legacy of films by Saida Medvedeva. There's actually a water part two. You know. Were you aware of this 15 years ago? When I worked on nuclear fusion in the late 80s, and I was a, an associate of Professor Bogdan Maglitz, no. When my position in the company was not a scientist, I was there to try to find funding. I had first introduced Dr. Maglitch's, you know, fusion um, technology and his advanced physics corporation to John Bryson, the, the head of Southern California Edison, right in Los Angeles. We met on the steps of Southern California Edison, and I thought they were going to fund it right there. And we had already spent $26 million on developing four prototypes of our fusion reactor, and each, each uh, reactor that we funded got greater and greater uh, results towards the goal of nuclear fusion. But it still seemed like something was missing. All over the world, there was, there were these, you know, these great um, consortiums of scientists working together on different approaches to nuclear fusion. But there was something missing, and I think it's really a godsend. This all came to me, and now I'm introducing this concept to the world tonight through your, you know, thanks to your voice and your show, hoping that there's somebody out there who believes that that we should be putting money in this. I mean, we should be we should be putting money back into nuclear fusion with a new approach. And this new approach is restructuring hydrogen with sound waves that, that are similar to the sound of the sun. Now, I know you were talking earlier at how quickly the water reacted from great distances, mm -hmm. right? Instantly, though, how soon can it change and react? Let's say you've got a batch of bad water and you do some of the things that... You, I'd like you to tell us about when we come back after the break, but how soon will it change? Instantly? Ten minutes? An hour? How long does it take? Oh, it happens instantly. According to Martin Chaplin, who's considered one of the greatest researchers on water in the U.K. and professor, he is saying the change happens instantaneously. Water's kind of like us. Imagine you're driving through traffic, and you have all this impetus. You're seeing a sign here, a person's driving by there, and somebody gets in your way. Your con water is constantly reacting to its surroundings. The problem some researchers have is that they realize that if you're going to restructure water, you have to drink it right away. 
Hence, using the sound of sun with the sun with a good set of speakers and a pitcher of water and drinking it right away is the best. Actually, restructures water. Why, does it revert back to a bad state if you don't? Um, if you put it, I mean, this was an amazing experiment done uh, where this is actually a ritual in the Catholic Church where holy water is carried by this nun, and she's not allowed to speak or even think when she's delivering it to the priest. And this was known, you know, thousands of years ago, this stuff about water. In fact, Leonardo da Vinci was restructuring water. That's a whole other story. Um, he knew how to restructure water yeah. to such a high degree when he gave it to uh, Francis the First, uh, uh, you know, where the Mona Lisa, you know, the same person he gave the Mona Lisa to. Apparently, it empowered uh, Francis to become the great, you know, ruler of France. And it's attributed to, to Da Vinci's secret water, which he never gave the formula to. So the problem is you have to be utterly silent. You have to, as soon as you have a negative thought, the water will, will be affected by it. But it doesn't necessarily override the positive impetus. But using sound waves that are very powerful and concentrated, like the sound of the sun, the, the restructuring, uh, just using that simple sound with a set of speakers, you know, we, which we have available, will restructure water to a level that nothing, no machine, not, no restructuring uh, technology could possibly duplicate. It is truly the highest value. When you look at that photo on your website, it is so perfect. In fact, one of the most um, profound researchers in the actual science of what it means to restructure water, Leonid Izvikov, says that the more harmonic, harmonic the energy informational structure is prior to freezing, the more symmetrical and the more beautiful the crystal appears. So, and if people, David, have their own little microscopes, okay, at home, not everybody does, but if they do, they can conduct their own experiments and look at frozen crystals of water that way, can't they? Well, they could, but you need to be able to flash freeze the water instantly. There's a difference. Uh, you have well, to have we don't have that kind of equipment. Because it's not going to freeze instantly. See, what happens when a sound wave or even a thought... Hold on. Hold on right there, David. We'll come right back to that. And next hour, we'll take phone calls with our special guest, David Sarita. But when we come right back, we'll talk more about Water the Great Mystery on Coast to Coast AM. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. David Sarita with us. David, uh, let's pick up where we were, uh, we were talking about uh, the ability of using this water and some of the various techniques to... Uh, make it even better for us mm -hmm. well we look at actually there's an amazing example to kind of antithesis of positive because the the positives on using restructured water on the human body are miraculous for example Perla Perla um, an immunologist in Nevada shows us an example on water the great mystery where we take a person with heart disease and she shows all the, the blood cells are all stuck together and they don't, they, you know, they're, it's almost like they can't breathe, they're suffocating. And she gives the patient a small uh, glass of restructured water and then tests their blood only 10 minutes later. This, this shows you how fast this can happen. And 10 minutes later under the microscope, the same person's blood is now all buoyant. There's electrical static charge around every blood cell. None of them are stuck together. They're all floating around, and they can breathe again, which means the body can heal. And this is just, this isn't medicine. This is just restructured water. So now you look at also, we see there's a case in the 1960s in Germany, and there's two cases like this, and this is quite scary. A um, toxic sealed ampule containing um, basically something that could be the equivalent of a biological agent, is dropped accidentally into a, a, a pitcher, a glass pitcher or beaker of ordinary water. And it's left in there for three days, and it's so well sealed, there's no way any of the, of the toxic biological agent can get from the, from the ampule into the beaker water. And the researcher sees it there, and she takes it out. And this actually happened in Germany in the 1960s. And they test the water that was in the beaker, and it tested healthy and, no, and ordinary. So they fed the water to, to uh, lab rats. The lab rats all died. Oh, my. Now, that, what that means is that it's, it's the information, remember, through action at a distance went beyond the, the seal 
in this ampule into the ordinary water and and gave it a new set of instructions, which is to kill. So that's how powerful this can be, and there's actually many cases documented very similar to that. So on the positive end, holy water, I mean, you, you really get an appreciation for the power of holy water and and why in all of the world religions, including the native Indians, there are these rituals around water. And also for the for the ancient mystic Jews, there was the rituals of, of bathing and cleansing the body before prayer. And, and there is a profound meaning to that, that the spirit of God or the spiritual force can bestow itself on the waters. But now in, on, in the healing arena, it's, it's really, in fact, I gave the sound of the sun to Len Horowitz, who has been on your show many times. Mm-hmm. And he was so astounded by studying the frequencies in the sound of the sun, he, he compared it to known frequencies that are known to heal the body, that are actually known to be healing resonant frequencies. And he, he quoted many of them in this, and he's actually including it in his, in his new paper. So I'm, I'm finding that this discovery of the sound of the sun is new. It corresponds with all of our ancient literature about the mystique of the sun, for the, including the ancient Egyptians and the Babylonians, the, the early Christians and the early Jews, that in the ancient Hindus, that this the sun's vibrational, you think of, for example, Ruth Drown's vibrational medicine, the medicine of, of, of radionics, of sending vibrations to a person through their blood, what happens if we use this master sound for healing the body? Well, Len Horowitz has confirmed that the healing frequencies are there. They're, they can be measured. So when, it, in, when you put the memory of that in that structure in water and you drink it, well, this, because this is so brand new, we can only imagine what's going to happen. It, it literally could be the Holy Grail. Well, I, it, it, what fascinates me, being an alternative medicine buff, I'd like to see how this changes things within your body if we ingest the good stuff. Yeah, and how long it holds also is, is also a question to be answered. I mean, that is something I know from, from talking to, to naturopathic doctors who are using and studying you know, restructured water. If we buy restructured water and it's in a plastic bottle and it travels around in trucks and, you know, it gets to us with all this added information, it's probably not the same thing anymore. I mean, the real truth of it is, I mean, a lot of these things are just sales gimmicks, but I believe having a water restructuring unit that's low cost and available to the world, according to the United Nations, over 2 billion people in the world don't have access to clean drinking water and bathing water. So. There, there are new technologies that, uh, and people that I work with, like the World's Nest Group and, and Robert Poir and Michael Fulton, who have been on your show, that there's new technologies that can take water right out of the air, right out of the humidity. And if you can take that water and give it structural information that's positive, we can, we actually find that according to NASA GOES satellite data, all the countries where there's no clean drinking water, these countries, of course, you know, you look at, um, Asia Minor, you see that they're loaded with humidity. You're living in some of the most tropical and subtropical climates mm-hmm. in the world. And, and even parts of Africa, there's a lot of water in the humidity factor. So there are new machines that are available that can actually take the water out of the air and make drinking water and bathing water. And it, it's really that's amazing. That's a great idea. Yeah, the long, it's, I, I always thought about what would a huge dehumidifier, how it would work, put into these tropical areas, and it would just suck the uh, the water out of the atmosphere. Yeah, you see, it's already being done. I mean, these things, this technology is available, you know, now through the World's Nest Group, and, and there are people working on this. You know, I look at, this is really an interesting idea because it's, it's related, but it's off subject. We just had this new $700 billion bailout package, right? Yeah. What would happen if we put $50 billion into the companies that are building new electric cars so that they could build hundreds of thousands of them. What would happen if we gave a billion dollars to, you know, these, this new technology that's emerging that can pull water right out of the humidity and we could supply water to all the villages in Africa and India. Gee, David, that seems too logical. I know, but you know, it's exactly. But, but what's amazing about it is, see, I believe one of the reasons a lot of those Wall Street companies and banks failed is they loaned money to to business models that are from the old world that aren't, aren't going to survive the next, you know, 
generation of human life. And if and if some of these institutions would start giving money and research and development into these new ideas, you would see a positive economy, a positive cash flow. You know, if I could do I, anything, I would I would love, for example, to see a test where let's let's say, God forbid, but we had ten people with uh, the all similar types of cancer, mm-hmm. and then you had ten people with similar types of that cancer, mm-hmm. and you gave the good, I'll call it the good water, you gave them the good water and the other ones just did what they did, okay? Mm -hmm. Kind of just drank out of a tap or something. I would be very fascinated and interested to see what would happen, what those results would be. Oh, I I would too. I think think I'll run that idea by the researchers. I think it's a, a great experiment, you know. What would you do with $700 billion if you could spend it? Well, I wouldn't be bailing out Wall Street, that's for sure. <laughs> I would divvy it up. You know, yeah. I would I would try to help the the cities, of course, and uh, mm-hmm. shore up education and create a investment pool for innovative technology, like you just mentioned. Uh, we we were talking about if people could look at this through a microscope, and you said they have to flash freeze it real quick. So I don't think everybody's got that capability, right? No, nobody has. Not everybody has the capability. But what what it shows us is that you see when a waveform propagates, whether it's a it, it's consciousness or whether it's a sound wave or informational wave, water is so sensitive it vibrates in the pattern and structure. So when you freeze it instantaneously, it's like you're capturing a photograph in a brief moment in time and what that information actually looks like. But there's actually deeper levels of information than just waveforms. For example, we're talking on the radio right now, and you can see the waveforms of the radio waves traveling through space, but inside of that are our voices, which is a deeper level of the information. And, you know, you go, the, the deeper you get into this water mystery, I mean, it's, it's so fascinating. It's so fascinating because I also look at, you know, going back to the beginning of the show, you, you add the spiritual element that you think, and you go back to the time of Pythagoras, you know, the, the discovery and the knowledge of what was known as the monad, which was the singular force in the universe that preexisted the gods and the goddesses, and God and the goddess. I mean, this is, this is an idea that Pythagoras got from the oldest civilizations in the world, all the way back from Sumerian, Babylonian, and Egyptian um, parts of the world. And then you also, you go, if you study the ancient Judaic literature, you find the same thing, that there was this force that, that pre-existed everything. And then it divides into male and female, or positive and negative forces, which we see in the quantum universe. And you see these fields. I mean, all the literature actually shows us this, that these consciousness super singularities, if you see them as giant rings that pre-established themselves even before the Big Bang, they, they show us that consciousness pre-existed the human or biological forms, and it creates hydrogen and spreads itself over the universe as an informational storage unit for that consciousness. And then eventually that hydrogen takes the form of the divine human. Now, going all the way back to your photo on your website, which I don't know if you've seen the one. I've had It's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. You see this form of the Virgin Mary on this woman's glasses, right? Um, that's the one I'm speaking about. Uh-huh. And you think, how did that happen? How did water tears on her glasses take the shape, which is just salt and water, I believe if that's what it was, because someone was praying in this church, how did it take on the shape of the Virgin Mary? I mean, it's so clear. I mean, it's an amazing <laughs> image. Consciousness told it to do that. It told it to do that. So what would happen at the moment of creation when the fields of hydrogen, which are ruled by the spiritual force of the universe, decide to give birth to the divine human, man and woman? It just takes on, and it gives birth to it. It's really, you can almost see it, how it all happened. Let's talk about the Akashic Records for a second. You touched on them briefly. Uh, Dr. Bruce Goldberg has talked about them in the Mm -hmm. past as well. Who kind of basically keeps this? It's almost like it's in the mind of God, right? Well, see, that's one, one of the things I'm looking at here, the possibility that 
the records of everything that's ever happened in perfect accuracy. The ancient Hindus say that if you were, for example, in the presence of a tree and you go into the super state of samadhi, and there are these, these nine levels or six levels of samadhi and three nirvanas, and you're in this super advanced state of consciousness, you, and you, you focus on the actual atoms in the tree, and they start to show you pictures of everything that's happened around them. I often, you know, when I think of that, I think of, again, the laser coming through the eye of the DVD player and mm -hmm. going through the plastic, the ordinary plastic, and there's pictures, there's movies, right? Well, the ancient yogis say that everything has memory. Trees, of course, are loaded with hydrogen and, and water. And inside of, that, inside of that hydrogen are real pictures and images. Well, what if this hydrogen, the spiral arms of the Milky Way galaxy, the sun, the planets, all the informational systems of, of water contain the Akashic, the, the records themselves. That's what I'm thinking is happening. Now, I think there, there is a possible case. We're coming towards this now. It's not, it's not science fiction anymore. That everything not only has structure, like water has structure and memory in a sense, but what if there are actual pictures and, and memories in the water, just like our heads, our brains, as Kurt Wuthrich says, the Nobel Prize winner, your head is full of water, which is that where the memories are. And that would mean if we could extract that data, and I think this would make a great science fiction movie, imagine what would happen to the courts and the legal system and our government if you could know the absolute truth about anything. Tell us a few techniques, if you can, David, for just what people can quickly do at home. Uh, and again, the, the sun sound... Uh, is probably the most effective, I would assume. I believe, sonically, the sound of the sun is the most effective. You can see the picture on your website, and, you know, you can go to my website and you can obtain that um, for next to nothing. And then I think prayer uh, over water is very powerful, especially if it's very sincere. And if we just say a quick blessing and we run off, I, I really don't think it's going to be very powerful. I think exposing water to your favorite music um, will give you the vibration of whatever that music is, and whether it's you know heavy metal or classical, or, and that would be instantly, or right? the moody blues. It happens instantly. But the the argument is, how long can it hold the information? There are certain experiments where the information. Now that's a good question. Yeah. What are you finding out? Well, from going through a lot of the data, it seems that the more profound and sincere the information, the longer it holds. But it's not the only factor. There are, there are many other factors. I mean, is there a reason that, for example, you go into the church, into that quietude, and the holy water is in the vessel, and it stays there? And if you took that water out into the city and, you know, you expose it to the noises and the traffic, would it still, you know, have that power? And I, I think over time it eventually would lose it. William Reich talked about Oregon in the atmosphere, in, in the universe. Mm -hmm. Might he have been talking about this substance of water that uh, is in the universe? Well, it's interesting. You know, the Oregon, I know Trevor James Constable has done a lot of experiments. The idea of the ether and the Oregon energies, the more subtle substratums to the universe, that if you can alter just a little bit of the information on that subtle plane, the result on the physical plane is sometimes, I mean, incredibly obvious, incre incre incredibly profound. In fact, Trevor claims that he's able to use these argon energy tubes to cause it to rain, and, and he's demonstrated this several times. It's, it's, it's really amazing. But a lot of, actually, there's a guy I just learned about him. I'm reading his books, Gustav Le Bon, who was a sociologist, and and free-thinking scientist, kind of like I am. He didn't have a Ph.D. in physics or science. But his work predates Einstein, and it seems that he clearly understands E equals MC squared, that energy and mass are equivalent in this relationship. It seems that according to the World Research Foundation, whom educated me about Gustav Le Bon, the ideas of Wilhelm Reich... Um, the Royal Rife technology, which uses frequencies to destroy viruses and, and diseases, all comes from Gustav Le Bon. And Le Bon's work and his 
his thesis of work really reflects upon this this mystery of water once again because what Le Bon discovers is that if you for example if you take a piece of wood and this was an experiment that was um, Steve Ross the director of the World Research Foundation told me about if you take a piece of wood and you bombard it with radio waves or frequencies Tesla frequencies the Tesla frequencies cause the information in the piece of wood to expand out into the wave, and the wave propagates and shares itself over a great area. He shows this experiment where a scientist who studied Le Bon realized this, that if you, he took two little pieces of wood and put them in a black long tube that were activated by Tesla energy and put them in a very polluted lake. And within a couple of years, the lake completely restored itself. The waters were pristine, you know, the pH level of the water went way up, and there were fish, and everything was thriving again. So he, when he did this, the, the, as a contracted piece of work, the contractors, the people who contracted him wanted to know, how did you do it? And he said, whatever you do, don't open the, the black tubes, because that's where the answer is. And, of course, they opened the black tubes, and all they found was two little pieces of wood chips. They did it, but they weren't ordinary wood chips. They were wood chips that were exposed to this, this activation process. So what Le Bon discovered is everything, every element on the periodic table, a ruby, a sapphire, has particular information that's, that's kind of like tightly bound up inside of it. And so Le Bon found if you induced Tesla energy or frequencies upon that, it would cause that information to come out and share itself with its environment. So essentially, you know, the experiments we're doing on water work very similar. There are healing powers in the waters and information that we put in the water. I think it's remarkable. David, stay with us. We're going to be right back. We're going to take phone calls next with you on Coast to Coast AM. Sure is. And we're going to take your phone calls in just a moment now with David Sarita on Coast to Coast AM. David, before we go to calls, tell us about the universal memory system. How does it work? Well, that's actually my greatest interest. You know, when you, once you see the scientific evidence that water, hydrogen has memory and consciousness, and you realize that hydrogen is the most abundant element of the universe, it makes up 75% of the visible universe. And now, I, I don't know if you heard this, but scientists have actually found a big chunk of the missing matter of the universe, and they found it's ultraviolet hydrogen. It's hydrogen mm -hmm. vibrating in a higher frequency or higher temperature. So hydrogen is everywhere. It's in our spiral arms and our galaxies, and it's in our stars. And when you, when you really realize that all of these informational systems of water are communicating instantly over the vast distances of space, the idea of us looking for an intelligent signal in the radio spectrum at SETI seems almost like a waste of time. And possibly the reason we haven't yielded any, any real evidence for extraterrestrial life there is because that's not where the higher intelligences are broadcasting because light travels too slowly. So I'm really excited about applying this knowledge and develop, helping develop new super sensors using hydrogen or water sensors to see if we can actually get a signal of intelligence. And there have been experiments done very similar to this. There was an experiment in the movie Secret Life of Plants, which was, which was not even officially released, which I actually saw, where scientists pointed a telescope at the star system of Sirius, and they put a Faraday cage around the telescope, and at the end of the telescopic array where we look at the star system of Sirius, they placed living sprouted mustard seeds, and connected, you know, which are full of water, and living and they connected sensors to these little sprouted uh, mustard seeds and when they pointed it at Sirius they claimed the researchers claimed and one of the researchers is a very well-known astrophysicist today astronomer today at a major university I just can't remember his name right now they believed they were hearing what appeared to be coherent signals hmm. but what amazed me is this research was done in the 70s and I kind of I was so excited about it I thought you know why didn't you guys continue on this line and I think the reason they didn't continue on that line is there wasn't a strong enough case for, to explain why this apparent intelligent data was coming in. And now when you kind of add all the pieces together, 
and you realize that no super intelligent civilization would be broadcasting anything in the radio spectrum because it travels at the speed of light and it's much too slow, and you're starting to see this evidence of action at a distance through hydrogen aqueous systems like the sun and and you know um, bodies of water and telepathy. The, the evidence is overwhelming, and I, and I know there are a lot of conservative scientists because they're not personally involved in the research, and this is one of the arguments of Martin Chaplin in the UK, who's in um, who's in the the film Water, the Great Mystery, mm-hmm. and his argument is that these these people who say that water doesn't have memory, who are scientists, haven't been participating. Rustam Roy at Penn State University is another strong proponent for the idea that water has consciousness and memory. And all of this research is going on in American universities, Austrian universities, Japanese universities, China. All of this research is going on all the time, and it doesn't get reported. And, and really, thanks to your show, this, this kind of information starts to get out there. And if we support it, I believe the answers to our greatest questions, um, all of our greatest questions, including you know my ultimate you know, journey to find, you know, proof and, and evidence of extraterrestrial or beyond Earth, you know, communication and intelligence. So if we look at, we start, you know, where I would like to see this go is, you know, this exploring the ideas for nuclear fusion, healing on the body, reclaiming polluted waterways with restructured water, and then developing super sensors using water as the base. And that is already happening in Russia. That is actually already happening. Konstantin Korotkov, I actually interviewed him about this, and he's a professor with several PhDs at St. Petersburg Tech University. And he said they actually pointed, using one of these new sensors, pointed the sensor at the actual position of the Sirius star system, where it really is. And where you see it in the sky, it's the brightest star in the sky. It's 8.7 light years away. You're seeing it where it was in a delayed reaction because you're seeing it where it was 8.7 years ago. Its real position, when they pointed this new sensor at it, they got a signal. And I went, oh, my God, that, that is the most exciting thing I've ever heard. That means we can develop sensors that can tune into this action at a distance, instantaneous transmission of information. And that means, and the other thing that really strikes me is you think of, the idea that the ancient Hindus say that when you reach nirvana or super enlightenment, you know, and nirvana for the Buddhist or enlightenment for the, the Hindu, the world appears as an illusion, as a maya. It's not the real world. In physics, we see everything in delayed time because light, which we use to measure everything, is not instantaneous. So we're not really seeing the real time universe. We're, we are seeing a universe, and it is real to us. But it's not real time, meaning happening right now. This information that travels instantaneously through Einstein's spooky action at a distance is right now all the time, which means if we could, if we could get its eyesight, if we could get its sense, we could perceive what's happening anywhere in the universe instantaneously right now. We would see Andromeda as it is right now. We would see Sirius as it is right now. We would see everything as it is right now, and that is a different universe. It's probably more spectacular. It's probably more, um, well, it's definitely current, but it it, it would be the greatest revelation in science. I feel looking in the radio wave spectrum and and really the, the great numbers of money that Spielberg has contributed to SETI, I mean, it was a great experiment, but we need to move on. We need to move on because we realize this this is not where... Well, and Paul Allen, too. Hey, by the way, does, does this sound right, Sirius Magnitude 6 for that star? Oh, the magnitude of the star? Yeah, 6, oh. I think. Does that I sound think, right? Yeah, it's the brightest star in the sky, so that would be a high magnitude, yeah. Okay, let's go to the phones. West of the Rockies and Phoenix, Stephen, you're on with David Sarita. Hi there. Hi, David. Uh, hi, George. Hey, Stephen. Uh, I'm calling about restructured water, obviously. Mm-hmm. And I'm working in the field, and I've worked with Russ and Roy and, oh, wow. and some of the other people. And he published a paper that showed that, uh, and I restructure it with a resonance chamber, a high-energy resonance chamber. And uh, we've also worked in different spectrums, light, uh, microwaves, RF, uh, sound, that sort of stuff. And 
and um, we have been able to prove, in fact, I'm working it with right now because we're curing some kidney disease and liver disease with restructured water, and I hope we're about to enter uh, some um, clinical tests with it, uh, and it should be pretty soon, but we've been able to bring kidneys that were on the verge of dying back to full health again, uh, liver fantastic. disease cured in a week. Um, uh, and, and restructured water, one of the things we've done, I've had some tests done at universities also. We've been able to cure concrete in four days versus 28 days, and it cures at twice the strength of normal concrete. Oh, my God. Um, this plants, is exciting stuff you're talking about. Yeah, plants grow, grow twice as fast. And if you talk to Rustam, you'll find out that he published a paper that showed that water can be restructured and retain its structure for a long period of time, and it was on the work that I did. Uh, and he published it at the Material Research Society of uh, uh, of America. That's so. Great. What uh, is your name? What's my name? Yeah. Uh, Stephen. You want the last name? Yeah. Yeah, Stephen Settlemeyer. Wow, that is fantastic. Yeah, of course, Rustam Roy is one of the one of the most profound uh, researchers, um, George, in this field, and he's also in Water, the Great Mystery. So, you're saying that you you're there you're making positive progress for for reclaiming or, yeah, or which or is what we were talking river. about, David. That that is fine. by the way, Sirius, the magnitude is minus one point four two apparently. Oh, so I'm learning my astronomy again. No, no. <laughs> no that's something else. Does it see? It's, it just says the visual magnitude of minus one point four two is twice as bright as any other star in our sky. Mm-hmm. It's the so, brightest star in the sky. Yeah. Well, we know that. But minus. So maybe minus means bright, huh? I don't know. I'm seeing that on Wikipedia right now, and I don't. I don't know. Uh, it says. Let's see. It's about twice as massive as the sun and has an absolute visual magnitude of 1.42. It is 25 times more luminous than the sun. Minus, it should be minus 1.42. Well, that first one says mm-hmm. minus, but then later it says, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, mine says minus, too, on, on space.com. Right. Oh, on space.com. Right. Okay. All right. I don't Th- know Stephen, if that's a dash you. or a minus, but you can check on that. Next, let's go to Gainesville, Florida. Teague, you're on Coast to Coast. First time caller. Hi there. Hey, George. Good to talk to you. Thank you. Um, I'm a music teacher down here and a musician. I teach guitar and piano. Okay. And uh, I I was listening to you earlier talking about uh, Pythagoras and the music of his spheres. Of course, Pythagoras also uh, credited with discovering the layout of the scale, the harmonic sequence. Right. Um, Obviously, well, like, harmonics is essentially the geometry of sound. And uh, I can see how when it interacts with water, it sort of you know, restructures the geometry of its energetics. I was thinking about uh, when you're talking about heavy metal and how that maybe affects water differently and why some people find that pleasant versus other people finding Mozart pleasant. When you take two speakers and point them at each other, if they're playing, like, the same things, uh, it'll phase out the sound, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. They cancel each other yes. out. Right. They that, that's the theory out. of some of the black helicopters and why they're silent, Right. Right, they phase each other. They phase out the sound of the engine. Yeah. Well, anyways, I was thinking, uh, if you uh, had certain like negative energies in you already, and you know, your say your water in you was already affected with these negative energies, you would maybe need to phase them out with the same type of energy. Well, and that's a very creative like idea. <laughs> that's really interesting. Wow. I know anyway, I, I read Pythagoras, uh, the music of the spheres by Jamie, by Jamie James, which is an excellent read about. Pythagoras and how he gave birth to the intervallic system and the uh, monochord, which led to, you know, first he has the mystical experience, then he builds the, the theory, and then he gives us the intervallic system for the notes and keys, and then we have the monochord and then the birth of classical music. So it's really amazing what you're saying. But about waves, you know those new headphones, George, that Sony has that are that produce really, apparently block out all the outside noise, so you get perfect yes, sound. Yes, the expensive. They work ones. the same way. They just then they they mirror the outside sounds and they slam into each other and cancel each other out. So what the caller is saying is that if you have negative energy in you, then maybe you should slam neg- the same information at itself to knock itself out. 
<laughs> that's hmm. that's really interesting. I don't know. I mean, you should. Exp- that would be something to experiment with. It's a great, right. creative idea. Well, let's go to Bridgeport, Connecticut. Patrick, you're on with David Sarita. Hey, Patrick. Hi. Uh, hi. How you doing? Um, I once read a hermetic text that says you can cleanse um, your aura with water, but it spoke of the water should be at 39 degrees when it was most magnetic. Can you say anything about the temperature of water and hmm. its cleansing process? And I'll hang up and listen off the air. Okay. Has that come up at all, David? Well, the temperature of water, I mean, they actually talk about this in Water the Great Mystery. You know, when you get into the different levels of the pH values of water, and there are certain types of heat that kill the bad bacteria in the water and allow the, um, the pH levels to go up. So it, it does get into temperatures. So there, there's definitely a truth to what the caller is saying, but uh, I don't want to try to answer that because it's, it's, I think it's over my head. But obviously when temperature increases, magnetic fields weaken. So, you know, and water, of course, expands when it's heated and it contracts when it's cold. And when it expands, there, there's amazing, amazing pressure. And in fact, one of the most amazing little things you see is this sprouted seed bursting through, you know, the thick, um, heavy weight of the, of the soil. And sometimes you even see trees bursting right through um, concrete um, sidewalks and, and streets because of the power of water and life, you know, moving through, through these forces. So temperature is definitely important. I don't actually know the, the answer to his question, though. So, Okay, let's go to Rochester, New York. We've got Sam, east of the Rockies. Sam, you're on with David. Good morning, David. How are you? Good, good, good morning, morning, gentlemen. Right. Um, I had a question for you about the restructured water. With the one caller that called from Phoenix, I'm just wondering how it would be with, um, will it, once it gets reaches its advanced stages, will it um, help with longevity of life if, if it's ingested in, by human beings on a daily basis, like regular tap water? And also, would this be like, uh, quote, unquote, like, uh, you know, once it's at its peak, would that make, you know, people like, you know, like, uh, I don't know, I don't want to say Superman or whatever. I mean, it's just it's very, it's a very interesting concept that they're coming up with. I mean, if they're doing stuff with kidneys and livers, the way that this guy's saying, you know, then it would definitely um, either, you know, hit longevity-wise and everything like that. Well, that's a, that's a great question. I see. I predicted that the sound of the sun would restructure water to the highest value because the sun is the master of the solar system. And when I made that prediction, a lot of people didn't believe me. And when the data came in, it looks like it concurred. So I would say that drinking, and I've had experiences from drinking. I charged my water. In fact, I drank two glasses of water today. I put the water in front of the, my speakers, and you have to have speakers that go at least 20 to 20,000 hertz. You know, you don't want to use cheap little computer speakers. And you beam your water with the sound for, uh, you know, a couple of minutes and then drink it right away. I have already noticed things that have happened to me, but, um, you know, they're, they almost sound – it's a very difficult thing to talk about. Um, you know, I don't think that, that any, anybody who drinks it is going to have the same experiences, but I think you should try it and, and experiment with it. It makes sense because if water restructures everything to a harmony, and a harmony is when any, any, you know, one, any more than two or more vibrations relate to each other in, in an architecture that produces basically a beautiful um, sound or symphony, you're definitely going to bring things more into order. Most studies done into the frequencies of cancer viruses and, and you know, other diseases in the body there is a disharmonic, there is a disharmonic energetic. So when you bring your system, and actually I forgot to mention this, Konstantin Korotkov invented this camera that can see all of our seven energy centers or chakras in three dimensions. In fact, it can see how much energy in amplitude is coming out of all the seven energy centers from the base of the spine, the sex center, the belly center, which is our life center, the adrenal glands, which is in the sternum area in the liver, the heart, the the throat communication, the inner eye, and the top of the head, right? Well, when they exposed a person to the sound of the sun, interesting enough, the amplitude of all of the chakras went way down to almost nothing, and the heart got big, huge. So the sound of the sun seems to activate the heart center, and 
and shut down all of the other centers, which is really an amazing phenomenon for the researchers to see. Another interesting thing is the heart chakra is symbolized by the color green, and our sun produces more green light than any other color of, of light in the, in the rainbow spectrum. So in amplitude, there's, the sun is producing more green light, which is symbolic of the heart center. So there may be a correlation there as to why the sound of the sun activates the heart center more than any other chakra. So there could be something there. But, you know, experiments need to be done in this. I'm not going to claim that the sound of the sun is the, is the you know, elixir of longevity. You know, or is the is the holy grail for eternal life? I mean, it's. I'm not going to say that, but it makes sense scientifically that if you if you put things that are harmonics in your system, in your biology, in your body, you should be, you should have an increase in, in at least in life energy. I mean, I can't I can't claim things like that. Let's come back and take final phone calls with our special guest tonight, David Sarita, right here on Coast to Coast AM. Well, on our next program, as the week continues, Mark Seifer joins us. He's a psychology professor, expert on Tesla, and he's going to combine Einstein's theory of relativity to some of Tesla's theories as well. That'll be our next Coast to Coast show. David, does this universal memory system, is it much like what Lynn McDagger talks about, the field and what I've always called the wireless Internet? Yeah, it really is. The field is what the information propagates through. And I believe there isn't just one field, there are these nine levels of the field. And each higher ring, if you will, rules and, ha- and, and presides over all the, the, the rings beneath it or, 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 or uh, in lower vibration to it. So there's a sense of oneness or all connectivity in each of these fields, but the higher and higher fields have higher and higher informational systems. You see the nine levels of the angels, and if you look at all the different levels of the angelic kingdom, nine symphonies for Beethoven, you see nine levels of, six levels of samadhi and three nirvanas. When you go through all the world religions, you'll see evidence of these super, nine, like Dante goes through the nine levels of the paradiso, the paradiso, so the nine levels of heaven. The number keeps showing up. It's everywhere. It's, to me, there isn't just one super field like Lynn McTaggart proposes. But what I love about her work is that she's showing scientific evidence of it. Einstein said that there's no room in this new physics for both the field and matter, for the field is the only reality or the greatest reality. So now we're starting to to see the proof that everything is communicating with everything. And that is a sense of oneness. But I think there are higher levels of information that are only accessible um, to consciousness that evolves into these higher dimensions of, of, uh, of enlightenment. All right, let's go take final calls. Mike in Vancouver in Canada. Go ahead, Mike. Michael, you there? I'm here. Okay, Hello? great. Go Hi. ahead. I've got something to share here. Uh, just let me download you guys. Uh, when you talk about uh, restructuring the water, I do that also, but I do it with dowsing programs. Now, to hold the dowsing program, I use organ generators. I also use the ley lines and grid lines and a channeling that I do that was activated in the harmonic concordance. Just recently, I started making organ generators in the shape of hearts, green hearts, to put over the hearts. So when I go into channeling, I activate people's um, heart centers. I also work with the tribal harmonic scene up here. They are what I call musical alchemists, DJs, through the sound and the VJs, the visuals, um, and geometry. I work with the crystal grids. I found crystals up in mountains, and there was a, a river that got polluted by a train that went up the tracks with some pollutants and killed all the fish. I was above that, and I'm running healing water programs on that when that was happening. There is so much that um, I have the evidence also that you speak of, of communication from the other side. I have in photographs just recently the orbs that I'm photographing. I'm taking pictures of them in the dark, and I'm photographing the energy. Just recently now the orbs are shooting beams of light into the grid. This happened last weekend. I'm also going to be doing a, another event called the Realmosphere. It's coming up in Vancouver. You'll find me on Tribal Harmonics if you like to check this out. Thanks a lot, guys. Okay, there you go. <laughs> All Lots right. of information there, David. We just got downloaded. <laughs> Let's go to Randy in Dayton, Ohio. Go ahead, Randy. Hi, George. How are you, sir? Good. Uh, Thank your you. Your guest, David. Uh, this is uh, uh, Moon.
Moon Dog from Nighthawk Zone. Sure, um, absolutely. Yeah, uh, uh, you're talking about the harmonious of water. How how you know how water is an important part of our life, and we should be in harmony with water. Is it our bodies like seventy percent water? Seventy five. Seventy five percent. Okay. Uh, also, I, I'm not going to stay on here long. Um, I, I was a former truck driver, as you know. Um, I had left uh, some uh, bottled water in a truck uh, during the winter time, and it had froze. And I went back for vacation, and it thawed out. And on and, and the bottom of these unopened waters were white particles floating at the bottom. I mean, they wouldn't float to the top; they just they, they like settled down at the bottom. Yeah. Now, would that would that you think would be from the plastic, or God knows if someone took and um, you know put it underneath a tap? You know how the <laughs> you know how they were saying that yeah, it's probably water. just some sediment that was um, you know over over time. It was in there for months, right? Added minerals and things like that. Yeah, all that. Okay. Maybe it could have even been salt that just. Accumulated. What do you think, David? Well, I think you're probably right, George. It could be. It could even be. You know, calcium in the water. You know, we have a lot of calcium in the water in Sedona, and it settles um, at the bottom sometimes. Probably fluoride. Yeah, it could be. Ooh. Yeah, that's all we need. Jim in Allenton, Pennsylvania. Go ahead, Jim. First time caller. Well, first I'd like to say I, I love your show. I've been listening for quite a, some time now. Well, thank you, and, Jim. Uh, well. I'm a hunting enthusiast. I got a question for you, and then I, I got a sort of story going on with it. Um, you were saying how our bodies are made up of uh, water and everything. Yes. And, yes, we've been mentioning harmony with it and everything. So I've been wondering, do you think, like, being closer to certain different bodies of water, in a way, affects our emotions? Like, if you're – I've been out hunting before, and I know I get more antsy and everything when I come near fast-running water, and still water just seems to give me more patience than you can imagine. So I, what do you think, like, uh, the moving movement of water has to do with our harmony? That's a oh, good that's, question, that's, David. That's actually a great observation. When you when you come upon really still water, um, you feel very peaceful and very calm. And when you come upon agitated waters, it it really activates you. Like when a surfer is inside a you know a tube and the water is just crunching through it, they get really high. They get really energetic from all the po- all the negative ions actually coming off of the water. So yeah, I mean that's that's a good example. You know, this this man spent a lot of time in the wilderness, like I have, and. You definitely get a real feeling from the water. It's not just a visual. There you go, Jim. Let's go to Jerry in Tempe, Arizona. Hey, Jerry. How you doing, George? Uh, okay. Yeah, I kind of had a flash uh, when he was talking about the bacteria with the sunspots. Uh, it happens instantaneously. Now, does it, wouldn't something happen just before an earthquake, and you could be able to use a water sensor to detect the... Uh, agitation or the bacteria before the earthquake uh, actually occurs? That's a great question because there's there's researchers who have developed sensors to, to precognitively detect earthquakes, and this is actually going on. It's being studied right now. It's actually in part two of Water the Great Mystery, um, and you can actually see this being done. You know, sometimes researchers, just like Roger Nelson at the Global Consciousness Project at Princeton, they do their research for 20 years before they go public with it, so you don't always hear about this stuff. But, yes, that, that type of a system is in development right now. It is being tested, and, and from what I can see, the results are pretty positive that it can actually precognitively detect earthquakes and be be used, uh, interface with advanced warning systems. You know, recently, George, I was I attended a Homeland Security meeting at the Bob Hope Airport in, in Burbank right. with Cohen, Under Secretary Cohen, and the meeting was to educate Hollywood producers and filmmakers about all of the breakthroughs in Homeland Security. And I was able to introduce a very profound physicist, Dr. Bogdan Maglitz, whom I mentioned tonight, to him. But I actually found him to be the most open-minded um, sec- undersecretary on technology and ideas. And I introduced him to the concept of using some of these new sensors in consciousness. For example, Roger Nelson found that, you know, four hours before the first plane strike on 9-11, 
the random event generators produced these huge non-random spikes. Yeah, big spikes. They yeah. didn't know what was going to happen, but they knew something was going to happen. And I mentioned to Cohen, what if we interface this with with warning systems that at least put us on alert? Like, it doesn't say we know it's going to be an earthquake or it's going to be, you know, something negative, but at least it can, you know, the information tells us something is about to happen. We don't know what it is. And he was really open. I was really blown away. So there's like, a lot of applications oh, to yeah. Huge. Th- these new, these new um, super sensors. Let's go to Spartanburg, South Carolina. William, you're on with David Sarita. Hello, my name is William. I'm from Spartanburg, South Carolina. Uh, I wanted to ask your guest if he had tried any other types of music, such as music from different video games like Final Fantasy, or music from some of the Japanese animation, some of their opening and ending music. Because it's it's really uplifting for me because I listen to the music a lot, and I wondered if he had tried any of that. All right. Any uh, variation there? Well, I would say if the music is uplifting to you, then all the water in your body is getting uplifted because for you, you resonate with that music. So you can feel it. It's happening because you feel that way. So it's just a basis of your own, I guess, uh, wants and desires. If you like something, then it might work for you. Yeah, some people are even they don't even want to be in a harmony. Now, if you want to experience disharmony, you will experience the results of disharmony. And it may not be pleasant, but that's what you seem to want to experience. If you listen to a harmonic music, and there's a lot of great, even modern music that has great harmony, then you're going to experience harmony. There are deeper and deeper and deeper levels of harmonics that I, I think most music cannot touch upon that exists in the cosmos and you know there is there is a deep truth to those who practice meditation and recite you know holy mantras or holy words in in, in various religions and what they experience in their mind i've never listened you know to answer the caller i've listened to all types of music and and i'm not opposed to you know even heavy metal music I'm, i'm not you know saying that it's evil or anything like that it may not produce beautiful symmetri- symmetrical architectures and frozen water crystals, but that doesn't mean that you don't feel a certain way when you expose yourself to it. However, the highest highs I've ever experienced myself are in classical music. So that's just me. I'm not saying you know what's going to happen to everybody else, but you know, exposing myself to all different kinds of music, I've never been higher than listening to Guerrero's Red Poppy, probably, in, in, in uh, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Do you know if Dr. Emoto is continuing his experiments and uh, well, is actually, evolving? Well, actually, I did. I introduced him also to the sound of the sun through his son, Hero, and also the sounds of the planets. And they are also going to be testing this as well as, as the Russians. So the Russians were the first ones to do it. Um, they were the most interested in it in the beginning, and now... I found it really hard to get to Masaru Emoto when I finally met him and I told his son about it. He was so excited about testing the sounds of the planets, and I just sent them off to them a couple of weeks ago. So hopefully they'll be, they'll be testing it and getting more data on that. So, yes, sure he, he's very active. But he did tell me one interesting thing. In his own country of Japan, he is not popular with the mainstream scientists of his Why country. Why not? Is he a rebel? Well, it's it's kind of like, you know, you really have to read Gino Serge's book, Faust in Copenhagen, to see how all of the scientists that eventually got Nobel Prizes, um, you know, from Einstein to Max Planck to Heisenberg and Bohr, all of them, they all fought with each other all the time. But because they fought with each other, they were more creative. They bounced ideas. They may have disagreed with each other, but that disagreement was like a play. It was healthy. It was healthy. And the greatest revolution in understanding in quantum mechanics resulted from those arguments. So when so- don't think that in the media, because scientists disagree that water has consciousness, for one, that it's true and it means anything, unless they personally engage. And secondly, these guys love to argue because it makes them more creative. So the problem with the media is when they interpret, like somebody just got their Ph.D. and says, Oh, this is all nonsense. How could water have memory? Well, I mean, there's there are thousands and thousands of people with PhDs in very specific areas of research, and and so Martin Chaplin argues. I mean, you have to get in this particular area to see the evidence before you make a, you know, a statement that that is you know anti antithetical to to the evidence. So, 
Uh, let's go to Memphis, Tennessee. Hello there. You're on the air. Yes. Go this ahead, is sir. John in okay. Memphis. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, what I thought about was the, uh, you know, Bruce Lee himself was talking about water becoming water as far as a fighting form. Mm -hmm. And you think about his energy and the speed that he had that was no man has matched that. That is something else. And I wondered, did he have something then? Well, I'm a huge Bruce Lee fan. Um, Oh, I am too. <laughs> and I, I'm deeply mystified by the man and also his son, Brandon Lee. Mm. And I remember him talking about that, to become like water. And if you read the words of the Taoist masters, you know, you see the same philosophy. Um, there is really something to it. I think it has to do with learning how to synchronize your mind and your consciousness, like Bruce Lee was able to do, and slow it down and, and put it into the space of water. And I think he studied water. I think he sat there and he watched it, you know, moving over the rocks and streams and how it moved. And he learned how to move like water. You know, just like Leonardo da Vinci knew the secret of restructuring water, you know, in, you know, over 1500 years ago. So truly remarkable, David. Absolutely. It is. It's so simple. You know, we started talking about water, but water is like, it's, it, it's becoming like a world in itself. I mean, it's so phenomenally sensitive, and it's so, in, it's, it's so exciting to see that. I mean, I'm excited to see that this kind of research is going on in major American universities like Rustam Roy at Penn State and Pearl La Perla. And, That's good. And Gary Schwartz at Tucson. I mean, Harvard, Yale professor. There's so many incredible researchers in this film, Water the Great Mystery, that it's really quite overwhelming. And yet... I feel like more attention needs to be focused in these very positive areas of research that we're doing so that we can benefit more from it. Let's go west of the Rockies. Pat, you're up with us. Hey, Pat. Hi. Um, I just wanted to uh, call and let you know I have a friend that um, um, uses that living water, yeah. and I loaned her my uh, Royal Rife electronic residence machine because <clears throat> it had settings for uh, MS. Okay. And she was legally blind, and it not only helped her eyesight, but it cured her MS, and she hasn't had any incidents for two years. That's remarkable. You think it was the machine or the water? I think the combination. Maybe. Uh, Maybe. It, it helps me. My machine helps me with my arthritis, uh, but that combination of the water and the machine, it, it and within six weeks, she was cured. Wow. That, that is amazing, David. David, how important is positive thinking, belief system, that this well, is working? Let's see, my brother and I talk the about the placebo this effect. If you have a positive thought on a sea of doubt floating underneath you, this deep reservoir of negative experience and doubt, and you say, okay, I'm going to say positive, I'm going to say the word love, and you're jumping, and you're really struggling to say positive, positive, and love, and all of a sudden, as soon as you let go, you just sink back into the sea of your doubt. There's no, it's, there's no easy, superficial way to have a true positive thought. Po thought is very profound. It, it's, it's pivotal. It is so important to the transformation of, of consciousness and healing. I, went, I attended this one particular Buddhist meditation retreat for sitting you know, 12 hours a day, and I went into this state of such supreme positivity and ecstasy and bliss. It was really amazing. In this state, I decided I want to have a negative thought and see if I can make this bliss go away because I was really high. Yeah, yeah. And when I, as soon as I had a negative thought, the bliss enveloped it, and the negative thought became comical because it was so weak. So what I'm saying is when you reach a true state of positivity, a negative thought has no power because it becomes overwhelmed by the light. But when you're living in a state of, of disharmonic and dark energy and you're trying to have a positive thought, well, there's two things you can do. You can repeat the positive thought like a mantra over and over and over again until your whole being resonates with it. Or you can say it superficially ten times and walk away, and it probably won't be very powerful. David, thank you, my friend. We are out of time. David's websites are linked up at coasttocoastam.com. The DVD we're talking about is called 
Water, the Great Mystery. So let's wrap this up for Jason Bowers, Wayne Roberts, Lisa Lyon, Lex Lonehood, Sean Ladasur, Ross Mitchell, Ian Punnett, Tom Danheiser, Art Bell, the whole crew. I'm George Norrie, somewhere out there on Coast to Coast AM. We'll see you on our next edition. Until then, be safe, everyone.